Um, so what could be a better follow-up to that than hearing from a person who has spent her lifetime in rodeo and who has stories about the town's resurgence after the railroad? Izzy Escobar is one of only a few people who can retell these tales. Izzy was born in Rodeo and is one of the town's few remaining original residents, along with her husband Ramon, her brother Junior, and sister Alice. Her family has lived in Rodeo since 1920, when Izzy's father, Elias, arrived. Her parents, grandparents, aunt, and her aunt's husband are buried in the Rodeo Cemetery. Izzy has been instrumental in much of Rodeo's history. She is still active on the Emergency Planning Committee, as manager of the Community Center, as dispatcher for the Fire Department, and as director of the Rodeo Cemetery. So, we're going to get Izzy up here right now. But anyway, in the spring of 1977, Ramon and our three sons, and I had only been here about two to three months when our community was called about a trailer on fire at the, on the Pine Street area. And a few months later, an old house on Shady Street, a can on fire. We didn't have enough water or hoses to take care of the problem, and the community decided we needed to get a fire department started in our town. The only place large enough to have a meeting was our Catholic Church Hall, and we had several meetings and decided to contact our Hidalgo County Manager and get some ideas from him. We were told that we needed to contact the New Mexico State Fire Marshal, which we did, and we found out, first of all, $1,000 worth of equipment was needed for training and for for whatever else that we needed, for the people that would eventually become our firefighters. A gentleman, J.C. Lambert, suggested contacting his son, who worked at a mine in Hayden, Arizona. He had informed his dad that they had a good used fire truck and that it was in a very good condition and would probably sell it to us at a good price. By June, the county had passed a resolution to make Rodeo a county-recognized fire district. In July, some of our men made the trip to Hayden, bought the truck for $1,000, and brought it to Rodeo in 1978. Earlier, the community had started having diamond dip dinners, getting donations from our community members and other people from surrounding communities. Our fire department got started with not just men, but we women were involved with it too. And we took training to become firefighters. Uh, somebody had already mentioned it, and it was delaying about us ladies getting involved with all of that. The next thing would be our community gatherings were still going on. And uh, it was mostly women, so we became the Rodeo Women's Club. In 1979, some of the women, Custy Mozzi, Alice and Nettie Somoza, my sisters, Tony Mora, my cousin, and me. And we were gathered to enjoy a Coke at the Rodeo Grocery, owned by Lloyd and Custy Mozzi. We had been talking about the 4th of July coming up soon, and we decided that we should have our own parade and invite all of our close communities. We brought it up at the next meeting, contacted Portal, Apache, Animus, and our own town. Everyone was excited about it, and we had just cleaned our cemetery, fed our workers, and made plans of what to feed our 4th of July people, and what else we needed to do. We had volunteers to close the highway from the north side, and more on the south end. Everyone was getting ready. On the 4th, the post office, where the swap shop is now, was going to be where people would sign up for the parade. People started coming on decorated pickups, some with trailers, some without, all decorated with ribbons of red, white, and blue. People all dressed up, painted faces, our American flags fluttering all over. People, kids riding bikes, wagons, and, and what a day. The parade was great. 
After, all the, after the parade, everyone gathered on 2nd Street and in front of Alice and Victor's home, games for the kids were started across the road. There were sandwiches, cakes, pies, sodas, water bottles, and ice chests, and everyone enjoyed the lunch. They sat down to visit, and when Junior Gomez and his two daughters started playing their, their guitars, the sound of country music made everybody get up to dance, kicking up dust, but enjoying it. After a few dances, we noticed a whirlwind coming towards the crowd. When it hit, everyone ran to their vehicles, and that was the end of our first Fourth of July. <laughs> okay, the fire truck. That same year, 1979, our fire station was built, and those interested in taking an EMT course through Cochise College, which you ladies would probably remember that, classes in Apache and in Portal, Rodeo and Apache people in the Apache school, and Portal in the Portal library. After we all finished with our Arizona EMT course, we were ready to get our first ambulance. We contacted the Lordsburg EMS and were told we could not have an ambulance. We needed to be certified in New Mexico. So we New Mexico people had to do a whole new course and training in Lordsburg. It was different from what we had done in Arizona, but we did really well and came home with an ambulance. We could take our ambulance to Arizona since we were certified there and in our own state. Those, the next one that we're going to show would be the patches of both of our fire department and the EMS that we wore. Okay, and then our New Mexico, our new community building. In 1983, the day before the completion of our community building, everyone showed up to see it, have their picture taken and sounds of happy and proud people of Rodeo. We were so proud of it, and we still are. The next one is the new, the Ned Hall Park. We had talked about making a park so the kids could enjoy playing during the summer and some ramadas for travelers and our people to enjoy, but where could we do it? Ned Hall was at our meeting and he volunteered to donate a west side section of property that he owned close to the railroad track that was being taken out to make a new highway that we use now. We got the property and turned it over to the county. We had contacted the county and they were going to make it county property, but we would be in charge of it. They cleared all the mesquite and brush, dug trenches for the water line, and all the other work would be done by us. We put up the fence, the cement slabs, the ramadas, the basketball area, the tables, etc. A few days later, I was contacted by the county manager that one of the schools was pulling up the older playground equipment and ready to replace it with new ones. He wanted me to come and pick whatever I thought we could use in our park. I went that next day in our pickup and chose the playground equipment we could use. The county would pay for it, so I wasn't worried about that. The next year, with our baseball field done, water lines in, ramadas finished, some trees planted, we decided to have an Easter egg hunt for the kids and have Ned Hall cut the ribbon to open the park for everyone. We had kids hunting Easter eggs, Ned Hall cutting the ribbon, prayers, music, visiting with friends, and digging the holes for the trees that we were to plant in memory of those that we had lost the year before. For Custy Mozzie, my mom Ramona Gomez, and Bill and Will Swift, father and son. A few years later, we lost Ned Hall, and may they all rest in peace. And then, we can go to our women's baseball team. <laughs> There's some of us here, I think I'm the only one that, that you can see around rodeo anymore, but anyway, we had Harriet Schultes, but she's here today, Kathy Alba, Carol Maples, 
Nettie Somoza and her daughters, Patsy, Mary, and Clarissa Somoza, Sandy Arambula, Jesse Lopez, and I. And this is our manager, Joe Arambula. Poor guy. He had it, he had it going, let me tell you. But he had seen us playing, and he decided, I think they can do a good job. And so he worked with us. We played against Hachita, we played against Animus, and we played against, uh, let me see, who else did we play against? Uh, San Simone. And we really, really did a great job. We were so proud, let me tell you. And next we go to the pictures of Rodeo. And this is as it says in the early 30s. And there is another, another picture that we had from the 20s. I don't know if, if it's in there or not. But off to the side, you could see the top part of a, of a bigger building. And we could never figure it out because by the time we were around, that building was gone. But like this gentleman was talking about, I mean, there were not only bars, but places for men to come and really have a great time. <laughs> and uh, and we, we had heard a little bit about it, okay? But we, ne we didn't see it because by that time that building was gone. Along the area here, the only place that still left that had something to do with bars and all that is the a uh, long building that's next to where the old post office used to be, which is now the swap shop. The building is still there. And that was the old silver dollar uh, bar or whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and that's the only building that we do know that is still there. Right in here, this, this used to be the hotel, and actually it wasn't just the hotel. There was a post office there, there was a um, cafe, there was a grocery store, and the hotel up on top. And, and at the time, there used to be a Greyhound sign on the outside. The Greyhound used to stop there, pick up people, or or leave them or whatever. And so you can see all these buildings, which I don't remember, okay? So they were gone by the time I was around. Uh, what is now the Rodeo Grocery was a garage. And uh, where people eat now used to be the opening to the garage where they used to bring the old cars, the uh, vehicles, whatever, you know, to work on them. And I think about it now, I remember seeing that, but how things change, how things change, you know. Anyway, let's go to the, the old depot. That was the old depot. And I remember this, there was a lady, Mary Russell, was that her name? She was the postmistress. And when the train would come by, real sometimes slowing down enough just to hang a, a bag of, of mail. And so she would stay here and she would pick it up and take it to the post office. That was really interesting to see, you know, really exciting for me. And okay, the next one I think is another picture. Okay, this little child here was Custy and Lloyd's son. And the depot was already starting to get pretty old. And we were hoping, in fact, when Ramon and I moved in, moved back to Rodeo, we were hoping that we would be able to do something with it. But when we went around it, you could see where the, the side walls were already starting to kind of come down. There were holes. There were bugs that had already started eating on there. And we thought, oh boy, this is something else. We just won't be able to do, have anything to do with this. 
So we left it alone. Later on, it was torn down. And uh, you still can see part of the cement on the back. You can still see it there. And now it's part of our, our water department. And, uh, and as, as usual, if you don't watch it, you're going to get in trouble. And I'm the president of the Water Association. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we have the old pump house. And at the time, I remember it, it had those big old round, look like big old train wheels or something on there. I guess they used it to pump up the water from there. Once that uh, we started with the new water association, they had to take that, that thing down off of the top, and we had another building built on the side. So now we have this one that was completely redone, and it looks a whole lot better. It's repainted the yellow color, but it it's, looks a whole lot better than what it looks there. And, uh, and it worked out pretty well. Okay, now for the rodeo garage. That's the one I was talking about. You can see the, the place where they used to open it up and put the car, pick up whatever that they needed to fix up. Later on, they closed it up and it became a, a cafe and a little grocery store. And you can see that they were still selling some gasoline there. The top, where it's a it's a home where people can live in there. I think it's it used to be like two. Ah, uh, if I remember right, like two sets. So people could live on that side and some on this side. You could see where one side had the. Yeah, I think it's this side where it has the, tra the, the whole thing, you know, to come out. And the other one was on the other side. This has all changed a lot. And, uh, okay, now the next one. This one, they had noticed that, that some of the, the big old, whatever you want to call them, I, don't, I never knew what kind of bricks those were. They were kind of, uh, I don't know, they were kind of a whitish color. Maybe that's what it was, yeah. They were starting to get very loose, and it was scary to go right around it. And so then uh, they had some people come in and start tearing it down. And it was so sad, because we remember this used to be where you'd walk in to the post office, walk in and go all the way to the back and there was a a little cafe the middle one has had a door for the hotel to go up and the other side was the grocery store and all of this belonged to the cambage family bill and margaret cambage later on when they got rid of it they bought the other uh where the garage was and they made that into a, a small grocery store and cafe. And that's where everybody started coming. And this one was kind of left alone and it started falling apart. It was very, very sad because I remember as a little girl, my two older sisters used to work in the grocery part. One of them would come over and work in the cafe for a while and then go over and help the other sister. And those were my sisters, Connie and Irene. They were the older ones. Okay, let me see. Oh, and then we have the Robio Tavern. That, I can't say too much about it because I was too little at the time. I remember seeing it. I remember seeing a lot of people coming in. And uh, of course, look what they were there for. <laughs> And uh, beside this, on the other side, of course you've seen that there is one house that they used later on for something else. They had two homes in there. And behind those, there were four small houses. 
and I think they rented their out. I never, I never knew what they were used for, but they looked like they might have held maybe one small uh, bed or something for them, like people staying overnight. But otherwise, I had nothing to do with it. I didn't know any better. I know nothing, you know. <laughs> but um, we did at, at certain times when there were people that were getting married or something like that and they needed a place to have, have a dance. They always managed to use that back room. And as you can see, you can see all the paintings on the side. There was this one gentleman that had come in some some few years before that, that he had painted all of those things and they're still there, all that painting. Of course, now that uh, place is closed, we don't know if it'll ever be uh, fixed up again. What I have heard is that the last people that owned it really made a big mess of it. And as, uh, if any of you went before all of that happened, we had the owners, the owners that had the place at the time, they did a really wonderful job. They had it clean all the time. They had really good food, and people could get together there and really visit and just enjoy yourself. I don't know what's going to happen to it. It's very sad for things like that to, to happen. This is, as you're leaving Rodeo and going on the Animus Road, there is like a little curb. And I don't remember seeing these buildings because, again, it was before my time, but there were uh, little bits and pieces of walls that were still left there. And I remember my mother saying that it, it was very, very busy there for a long time. And some of these men would come in and and try to find somebody that could wash their clothes for them. I think they could do it over here, but I guess they wanted somebody else to do it for them. And uh, my mother was always ready to help people out. And she, was, she would do that for them, and then they'd come back and bring her, like if they had extra fruit left over, or extra bread, or whatever, and mother would tell them, no, you don't have to bring me anything. No, 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 we're very, very happy to have this done. But there's very little of it left there. But I remember my brother Junior telling me he was with the Boy Scouts and they used to go and set up and spend like a weekend. They would bring them, they would bring them out and they would set up their tents. They would sleep out in the open, some of them. And so they always had a chance to just stay around and they would learn a little bit more about what, was, what had happened there. The next one, this Ignacio Flores, we always called him Nacho. He was an Opata Indian from Mexico. And he had been living in the Chiricahuas for a long time. While he was there, he would go all the way to the top of the mountains and bring his uh, burros down, just full of wood. I mean, he would cut them into really nice logs and he would bring them down. And he knew the families that would need all of that wood and he would sell it to them. And that's how he would live. But he lived in a tent. He would never go inside a house. He was not wanting to even attempt or for anybody to tell him, come in and have a cup of coffee. My mother tried it. No, he wouldn't go in. He liked living outdoors. He was living just, I, if, if you're from Portal, you know that one section right there where the uh, turn off was to go up to, to Dr. Putsy's place and there's a creek that's, that's running through there. He lived right next to that creek. And one time, my mom and dad were passing by and they stopped to see how he was doing. And they noticed there was a big tear on the side of his uh, tent. They said, what happened to you? And then he showed him his arm. A bear had come in and he had torn the side. And so Nacho came out with, with a big, 
I think it was the big knife, he came out and he got after the bear and the bear started running. Well, he had, he got him with a, with a knife, but by that time he had a big scratch on his arm. Well, mom was trying to get him. Well, let me take care of it. No, he didn't want anybody to. He was really very much an Indian. He was used to what, what they did to take care of themselves and nobody else to take care of them. Later on, my mother uh, said that he had gotten ill. And there was a um, couple that lived towards paradise somewhere over there. And they took him in. They said, we'll take him to our ranch. And that way he can live there. And if he needs anything, I will take, we will take care of him. He wouldn't move from his, train, from his tent. He would be there. He would help him out but he wouldn't leave there. Later on, he had to go to, he had to go to, uh, to a hospital which he didn't want to go to, and he died there because of that. And the next one, that was when they pulled up all of the tracks. There's the overpass, the tracks used to go in that way. And so they started pulling all of this, <coughs> so that they could uh, put in the road that we have now, coming out of Rodeo. And soon after that, the overpass was taken down. <coughs> and all of that was gone. My brother had gotten a, a plaque from the people that were working on it, an audit that said, uh, built in 1936, Safe load, 15 tons, WPCH, 54. And my brother thought that was terrible for them to knock it down. And we did too, because we were used to seeing that there all the time. But they were wanting to get rid of it. It was getting older, and, and they were really afraid because we had so many semis coming through there. And we were, we hadn't really, figured that out until later on, they started telling us that, yeah, that was right, you know. We didn't want any accidents happening there. And of course, you can see our fellow seals in the back. So there they are when they were starting to tear everything down. But over to the side of that other uh, picture where they were tearing down the tracks, that's where we had the the uh, Ned Hall Park. And so we still have it. And we get a lot of people that do stop there. They get some rest. And uh, we miss our old overpass. We got so used to it. Another thing, though, that I wanted to tell you is that Yes, we women did do a lot of work with the fire department. Later on, as I got older, I told my husband, I can't go out fighting fires anymore. I can't jump out of the trucks the way I used to. I can't even climb into those darn things. <laughs> so what he did, he says, okay, well, whatever you want. Now I'm the dispatcher for the road and fire department. So that works a little better for me. <laughs> Any questions? Exactly. Yes? Do you know when the first road was put through here and when was it first paved? Oh boy, you would ask me that, wouldn't you? <laughs> that was before I was born, so I can't. Oh, long before you were born. Well, started. when they, they had that overpass built, it was in 1936. So that might have been when that road was, you know, put in. Because the other road, the main road that was going in there, as you're going into Rodeo, there's a little turn, and you can see that there was a road that would go straight into kind of south from there. The new road goes off to the left. Well, that straight road was to go down maybe about four or five miles, and then it would turn left, and it would take you to Rodeo and it would cross over the, the railroad. Okay, one more question. 
Yes. Where is Ignacio Flores buried? They had taken him to, uh, what was the name of the place up there? Um, Fort Bayard, yes. They took him up there to be with the doctors up there. And he was not very happy, and I think that's what, what took his life right there. He's buried there. <coughs> and that was so sad because he thought that he could live a little bit longer if they would just leave him alone. But anyway, thank you guys.